Well, hello there, pharmacology students. We are going to move on to chapter two, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacogenetics. So to make this easier in small spurts, uh, as most of us have a tension span of an average of eight seconds, um, this is a true fact <laughs> based on research. So what I like to do is break this up. This definitely is not the most fun part of uh, pharmacology, that's for sure, right? We want to get right to the drugs, um, but we need to know the background of what happens when you take a drug, what happens to the drug, and what happens to the body. So that's the difference between pharmacokinetics, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Kinetics is our what is the drug doing in the body, how is it being metabolized, etc. And then the pharmacodynamics is actually what is happening to the body when you take the drug. So first I'm going to just do a slide set on pharmacokinetics. Uh, I will keep the same slide set all together, so when you print it out, you will print it out all at once. You can change the uh, to a plain background or however you want to do it to help with ink. Uh, so that's why I don't put it in a PDF format. All right, so fun, fun. The other way to, um, I like try to make my slides organized, meaning I like color because I feel like it uh, sticks better in your mind. So when you look at pharmacokinetics, I have uh, it in the orange, and then when you get to the pharmacodynamics, I have blue. All right, and the pharmacogenetics is just one slide, and it is red. Okay, so what is pharmacokinetics, which I just said, it's, the pro it's a process, and I'm going to go through the process with you. So go ahead and take notes, whatever you have to do uh, to try to help understand this. I think repetition is really helpful with this, and we'll do some things in class too. But pharmacokinetics is the process of the drug moving through the body because we want the drug to work in our body, right? We want it to do what it's supposed to do. So this is also... Um, to help you try to decipher in your head what is what. So the four, there's four processes that go into the pharmacokinetics, how the drug is uh, um, taken and then moved through the body. First, it's absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. So anytime you see absorption, it's an orange. Distribution's in blue. Metabolism is well, supposed to be purple and excretion's green as we move through the slides, okay? So absorption, the easy way to understand it, drug to bloodstream. You take the pill, you get the shot, goes to the bloodstream, all right? How is it absorbed? Distribution, it's in your bloodstream, now it has to distribute out to the body tissues. Metabolism, chemical changes. So what happens to the drug at this point? It breaks down and metabolizes. A lot of this happens in the liver. There are a few drugs that metabolize in the kidney, most are in the liver. And then excretion, how is it eliminated out of your body? So first we're going to talk about absorption here. So drug absorption, drug movement, it's moving from the GI tract into your bloodstream. So how does that work? So there's different ways that drugs are broken down. But just think you're taking a pill and it's in your stomach and then it breaks down in your stomach by either disintegration or dissolution. So when think of disintegrating, I'm sure you know like it, things are breaking down, right? So this drug, just say you took uh, a vitamin and it's breaking down into these small particles. Um, or process of combi combining small drug particles with liquid to form a solution. So Let's just say you took cough medicine. Well, it's already in liquid form, so it's already um, broken down, I should say. Uh, also, if you take capsules, you have the small drug particles that combines with gastric acid, and it breaks it down. So absorption, how it's absorbed. If you have an injection, it obviously goes right into the muscle, so it passes the GI tract. So how are the methods of, of absorption? So absorption, how is it going to get into your bloodstream? There's different ways of it getting to your bloodstream, and I'm not wanting you to necessarily, I don't want you to memorize drugs at this point. I just want you to know the process that there's some drugs that are able to do passive transport, some are active, and some are by uh, pinocytosis, it's called. There are 
as you know, thousands of drugs out there and they're all different. And it's just how the drug is put together, how it's made, what it's used for, etc. So when you think of passive transport, it moves from a higher to a lower concentration. Okay, it's by diffusion. Diffusion means it moves across the cell. Facilitated diffusion means that it needs a helper to get through the cell. So some drugs will just move across the cell wall without any problem, but it needs to go from higher to lower. That's the difference between passive. And then facilitated needs the protein to go through, and I'll show you a picture of this. So we have passive and we have active. Active requires energy and a carrier substance, so it can't just move through on its own. Um, it needs a, a helper, so which is an enzyme, uh, instead of the protein, so it's a little bit different than that. And then pinocytosis, a cell actually carries a drug across by engulfing the drug particles. So think of like a Pac-Man that's eating the drug and then it's bringing it through. So to give you an idea, passive and active. So passive transport, port, there's the diffusion, it'll just go from higher to lower, and then the facilitated, it actually, um, the first part here of the facilitated diffusion, you see how it's carried through a protein, and then the other one is pinocytosis. Um, oops, I want to go back to my thing here. Yep, that's what that is. Okay, so pinocytosis is the other one where it actually goes into uh, a protein and moves it through. When you look at the active transport, it's definitely using something. Multiple particles are going in at the same time and um, moving out of the specific enzyme or protein. So what affects absorption? Going back to this, what can affect it? So there's multiple things. How is your blood circulating? Do you have hypertension? Are you elderly? Your blood doesn't circulate as well. What if you have vascular disease? Uh, so you have maybe some blockages going on. You have had a stroke in the past, etc. So think of blood circulation is going to affect how the drug is getting into your bloodstream. Pain, stress, all of that stuff causes chemical reactions in your body. What type of food are you swallowing the pill with? Or, or maybe some drugs require no food to take it with. How much fat's in it? What's the temperature of it? If it's been out ice cold, perhaps maybe that specific drug's, drug's not gonna metabol or absorb as well. What's the pH and what's the route of administration? So the route of administration is important. So we wanna make sure we're doing the best route possible. Uh, in order to have it absorb to the maximum that we want it to absorb. So drug movement goes from the GI tract to the liver. Remember, it goes to the bloodstream, and then it goes to metabolize. So how does it get there? It goes through the portal vein that um, connects the GI tract to the liver. And first pass effect. Now, first, first pass effect just means how... Um, it's metabolized. So for example, so most oral drugs are affected to some degree of first pass effect. So lidocaine, some nitroglycerins, for example, are not given orally because they have really high first pass metabolism. So most of the drug would be inactivated. So when you do a nitroglycerin, you do it under the skin, for example. Uh, or I mean under the skin, under the tongue. So that's how it's going to absorb better than uh, by taking it by mouth because they found that if you take the nitroglycerin by mouth, it just is going to rush through your body and it's not going to really absorb into your bloodstream or um, even work. And lidocaine, there's no lidocaine pill out there because they've found, and all these are done through studies, that it goes through your mouth down to your stomach, and it really doesn't do much to metabolize, it just passes through. So that's what first pass means. So every drug goes through a first pass, but some are metabolized or absorbed in the body better than other ones. So I hope that makes sense to you. And now we're gonna talk about bioavailability. So what's the percentage of the drug that you're taking that's gonna be effective? So every single drug that you take so let's just say, for example, I take um, 
a pepsid for my stomach. All right, that's for helping reduce acid. Let's just say I take that, that pill. You think that 100%, you're going to take that, and 100% of the drug in there is going to uh, activate, but that's not true. So most, um, I would say 99% of the drugs that you take by mouth are always less than 100%. And again, the bioavailability bio means that um, what is the metabolism like of this drug? So going back to the nitroglycerin, it just goes right through your body. So the bioavailability is going to be really low. Um, another example, which is in your textbook, rosuvastatin, that's crustor for cholesterol, and it's 20% when it passes through your um, uh, your GI tract. So that's why we do take it by mouth, but that's why you take it every day because it needs to build up a level. So it takes a little while, which we'll talk about. And another example is digoxin. It's very high. So it's 70% to 85% absorbed. So that's your um, bioavailability. That much of the drug is available in your body. So with these types of drugs, um, you know, sometimes they need to be monitored with um, blood levels and things like that. And all IV drugs are 100% because it's bypassing that GI tract. Because remember, the GI tract, uh, you know, has the gastric acid. Uh, you can have different motility in your stomach moving and breaking down. Maybe it doesn't break down as well. Food, drugs, as it says on this slide. And then we have drug distribution. So now we're going on to the first part, second part. We talked about absorption, all right, on how it's um, going into your stomach. Talked about the first pass effect, what that means, and the bioavailability of the drugs. We talked about how it gets, uh, the absorption gets through uh, the cells. Now we're talking about distribution. This is now it's going from your circulation. It got to the bloodstream. Now it's going out to the body tissues. So how does this do this? Well, there's protein binding, and protein binding are specific, specific drugs are protein binding and some aren't. So in order for it to be distributed, some drugs have to be bound to specific proteins. So there's different types of proteins in the body. There's albumin, there's lipoproteins, and then there's one called AGP. I don't expect you to memorize that. I just want you to know that there's some drugs that have to be, um, in order to get to the body tissues, it needs to be bound to a protein. Um, for example, aspirin, uh, and they need to bind with albumin and lipoproteins. But like morphine uh, binds to the AGP. Again, you don't have to memorize that, but just know that every drug is different. So drugs, just so you know, drugs that are more than 90% bound to protein, so let's just say most of the drugs are bound to the protein, are known as highly protein-bound drugs. Um, so drugs that are 10% uh, bound to protein are weakly protein-bound drugs. So they're specific drugs that will bind a protein a lot, like most of the active drug, and some that won't. And then there's, or just a little bit. And then you have free drugs, and free drugs are able to exit the blood vessels and reach their site of action without any um, binding to any type of protein. So that's the difference between protein and free drugs. In order to find out, you'd really have to go to a drug handbook. Um, not even all drug handbooks talks about the drug distribution. Uh, there's the pharmacists have definitely have um, you know they're more extensive like micrometics and they use other things to look up the pharmacokinetics of the specific drug because it's real important to know if there's interactions between drugs. So just a picture form. It's not the most clear, but to, uh, it's a little blurry. But just to get you to understand, there's the free drug, and then there's the protein, how it sits, how it freely moves through to the tissues, the free drug, and then the protein bound, how it needs to bind to a protein to move through the tissues. Um, and remember, the blood vessel lining, you have capillaries. There's multiple other things involved in a blood vessel lining uh, to help things go through, but we don't need to know that. Just know it. That's 
some drugs need that and some drugs don't. Okay, whoops. Okay, um, here is another uh, example. So there's specific drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier and some that don't. And let's use the example of Benadryl. So Benadryl um, is called an H1 blocker. It's a very old medication that came out years ago. It works really well as an antihistamine. It does multiple things um, in your body as an antihistamine, reducing inflammation, helping with allergic reactions, uh, used for multiple things, but it does cross the blood-brain barrier, meaning you'll get that tiredness, um, that tiredness effect and stuff. So um, it's a little bit different when drugs move across the blood-brain barrier. It's a capillary, basically, and it's a um, you need a transport system to really get through. So you can see this T, that transport system. So that is how they're distributed through the blood-brain barrier. We need that blood-brain barrier because what it does, it protects the brain from any foreign substances, um, which include about 98% of the drugs on the market. So uh, there's drugs that we don't want, or most drugs we really don't want to go to the brain. And so how they're chemically put together, uh, we'll be able to avoid that. But Benadryl is one of them that goes across the blood-brain barrier. And here is distribution if a woman is pregnant, and this is more of like a placenta. Uh, so it's important to understand that um, there is actually a program. It's called LactMed, um, and actually every drug book you can look up a drug, and it tells you exactly um, if you should be giving the specific drug to pregnant women. They're categorized by A, B, C, D, and X. X is definitely something that we know for a fact from babies born that it causes deformities or death of the fetus. Um, thalidomide was out years ago. It was used for women with nausea. That's a category X. They found that they were being born without limbs or limbs being in other places on the body. That's an X. An A would be something like, um, I believe Tylenol is a, a category A. So just to give you an idea, um, most drugs are category B. That means they've done studies and the benefit of taking it is okay. Uh, a category C, they don't really know, but the risk weights the benefits. So for example, what if you're asthmatic and you can't breathe and you're pregnant? Although inhalers are category C, there's no studies that really say if it's good or bad, but you need to breathe, right? Because you need oxygen to go to the baby. So you say, all right, you really need to breathe. Your life's important, so we're going to give you this inhaler. All of these drugs that I'm talking about are either lipid-soluble um, um, or they will absorb better or they don't absorb better. So it's really important. So for example, if you're taking drugs through the first trimester, you can have an abor a spontaneous abortion, meaning a miscarriage, if you're taking the drugs that can affect um, uh, the pregnancy and how it's absorbed. During the second trimester, you can have abortion, tetrogenesis. That means that you um, can have limbs that don't develop like it should um, or subtler defects. And during the th third trimester, it can alter growth and development. So by that time, uh, the baby's organs are working, but it can alter the development and the growth of the baby. Uh, so just so you can understand that uh, there's different categories to uh, drugs for pregnant females as well as breastfeeding. There's a program called LactMed that you can type in the drug and it'll tell you exactly if it can be given while breast, if it's going through into the breast milk or not. All right, so let's talk about metabolism uh, for just a little bit here. So this is the part that can be really confusing. Uh, so metabolism, how is it metabolized? So it goes from the circulation out to the tissues, and now it's metabolizing. Most of your drugs are metabolized in the liver, and half-life is real important. Uh, so I'm going to try to explain this, but I'm also going to post a video. Um, a video, um, this guy does a really good job at kind of drawing a graph and pictures on the half-life. So a half-life is the time it takes for the amount of drug in the body to be reduced by half. All right, so 
Um, for example, you take a drug, uh, I'm going to take ibuprofen, and let's just say within one hour, it's um, at the highest that it can be, it's peaked. Think of a graph, and it's gone up. Like, think of a bell curve, but the curve's going to look different. It'll be at the highest point, all right? So that is the highest concentration. Remember I said that it's rare that any drug is 100%, so it's not. So it's a little below the 100%, let's just say. Well, then the half-life is, is how long is it going to take for that drug to be reduced by half? So that's what's measured. Um, and it's done through, obviously, um, studies, research. And so you take that drug, and let's say within one hour, that curve starts going down to half of what it was. Okay, so that what that's what the half-life means. Um, so there's a lot of things that can affect it, like your metabolism. Um, previous doses, have you take those before? Because there could be still a little bit in your system and then you take more. Elimination effect, how is it eliminated? Uh, for example, if you have liver or kidney issues, the half-life of the drug is prolonged uh, because less of the drugs metabolize and eliminated. So think of elderly people. When we think of elderly people, we think our body ages, not just our outside like our skin wrinkles and things, the inside too, all of our organs age, and so they don't metabolize the drugs as well. So many times they can be, um, these drugs can stay in your liver, and then if you keep taking it every six hours or eight hours, it's going to build up in your system, and then you can end up with kidney failure, liver failure, liver issues. That's why it's so important with a lot of these drugs to monitor with labs your kidneys and your liver, depending and um, if you're taking that so okay and um, so by knowing the half-life the time it takes for the drug to reach a steady state and so that's like the actual state that we want the drug to be in that will help it um, be determined by determining the half-life so the steady state is when the amount of drug uh, being administered in the state same as the amount of drug being eliminated a steady state of drug concentration is necessary so it takes about four half-lives if all the doses is the same. For example, digoxin has a half-life of 36 hours with normal kidney function, and it takes six days to reach a steady state of concentration. That's why these drugs um, aren't just eliminated or excreted through your body with one dose. It reaches a steady state. That's why you have to keep taking it um, you know, once a day or however which drug... Um, asks you to take it twice a day it just depends on the drug so there is something called a loading dose and these are with drugs that have a very long half-life so it may not be acceptable to wait uh, for a steady state to be achieved so let's think of um, dilantin or phenoytin that is for seizures uh, so we want the patient obviously to start working right away so we will give them a loading dose so we can get that at least therapeutic level going until it reaches that steady state. So there's multiple drugs that um, we'll end up, um, uh, we could do that with. Think of a Z-Pack, azithromycin, the antibiotic. That's the same thing. So it's given a loading dose because it has a really long half-life. Remember, it stays in your body for 10 days even though you take it for five days. Then we go to the last process of pharmacokinetics, and that's drug excretion. How is it excreted? Through the kidneys. The kidneys, um, how are they working? So if your creatinine clearance is normal, your BUN, which is the blood urea nitrogen, and your glomerular filtration rate, the GFR, then you can assure that the excretion is going to um, be normal uh, or excrete out of the body like it should. Um, but it's real important to understand that in order to give a drug, you really should see what their kidneys are doing. So what is their GFR? What is their creatinine clearance? And what is the BUN? Creatinine uh, clearance and GFR. So if you look at creatinine by blood, that's your total creatinine. If that's elevated, that says there's some kidney damage going on. So that means the drug might not be excreted. It might stay in the body, which would be not good. Um, the GFR, how is it filtering? Uh, remember, if you take, you should have taken pathophysiology. Um, how is that fil How is the glomerular um, area of the kidney 
uh, filtrating? Is it, um, you know, not working as well because of the aging process or not? When we get older, when we age, we have less body mass. So a lot of times we'll see that GFR uh, be, go down. It should be greater than 60, but once we age, for many people, it starts going down. So the drug excretion is going to be um, uh, different. Also in the liver, uh, bile, feces, lungs, saliva, sweat, and breast milk. That's how drugs are excreted. All right, so I'm going to stop right here.